in years. Angels will list an age and a gender. Most children are between the ages of two and eight. Some angels have a wish list. Others you can choose an age appropriate plaything, book, clothes, or holiday related items. Media themed materials are popular with younger children, while gift cards like Dunkin' Donuts or Walmart card are appropriate for older recipients. We are asked to spend no more than $25 on any one item. Be sure you wrap your gift. In the past, we have not wrapped the gifts. This year, we're asking you to wrap the gifts um, and also make sure you put your angel attached to the box so we can get to the appropriate child. Be sure your wrapped or box present is clearly labeled with your child's initials as they appear on the angel and place your gift by the tree no later than December 5th, please. Your gift can provide a sparkle of his light and a warm hug to these youngsters. Again, these um, children are here in Lawrence County. Uh, child and Youth Services, and we appreciate, again, all that you do for all of God's kids. We thank Miss Annie and also the Mission Committee for their faithful, their, really their prayerful faithfulness um, to give us all an opportunity to be in mission and ministry for our children who are really in great need. Um, in Lawrence County. We also have a testimony this morning. I love being able to say that from a Presbyterian pulpit. Uh, Miss Leslie, come on up here. She's going to give us her story of uh, the seeds of, of random acts of kindness. I have really had the pleasure and the privilege of hearing so many stories from so many of you in your experience of receiving these $5 and what God has done with it. So please give your attention to Miss Leslie. Thank you. Okay, so what I generally do this time of year or throughout the year is normally help people through, like in their homes or in their apartments. I'll do curtains or scrub walls, sometimes paint rooms. And most of the time I do this for free. But this year I've asked the people who can afford it to make a small donation to me. Um, and, and I'm going to use this donation. Well, as I was... I was walking through the church. I happened to go into the heritage room, and I was thinking about Betty Kitchen, and I don't think she ever started a conversation concerning First Presbyterian Church without first saying, my beloved church. And I was looking at that room, and it's looking kind of bad in there. So once I get all the money collected up, I am going to start to do some patching and some sanding. And with the crew, we're going to paint that room and get that room all fixed up in memory of Betty Kitchen, because I really can't think of a better thing to do um, on behalf of First Presbyterian Church than to remember Betty Kitchen. So thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And for those of you who may be visiting and wondering who was Betty Kitchen, she was 100. Was she 100? 101. 101? 100. And she just really entered the church triumphant just a few weeks ago. And it really is because of her and her vision that we have the Heritage Room. If you'd like to visit that, it's open when the church is open. And it really shows the history from 1798 when we were chartered as a congregation all the way through the years now in this building. Many people have asked me this past week, when was this built? It was finished in 1896. And a big part of what we see in many ways and in many areas was due to Betty's vision. So thank you, Leslie, and also the building committee in the session who will get more details about that in the coming couple of weeks. 
Well, this morning we were scheduled to have our special singers here. Um, unfortunately, Peyton woke up this morning and didn't have a voice to sing. And so Don was able to uh, uh, put something together in his repertoire, and we thank him for that. So my brothers and sisters, as you prepare your hearts, your minds, your spirit to worship the Lord this morning, remember that Jesus Christ is here in this time and in this place. It is Jesus Christ who stands at the door of our heart and who knocks. And when we open that door and we invite him in, he has promised to come and be with us and to dwell within us. And so my brothers and sisters, I invite you now to open your hearts and open your minds as we listen to the beautiful strains of the prelude. My brothers and sisters, please join your minds and your spirits together as I offer the opening prayer of blessing. God of the universe, Holy Father, the heavens cannot contain your glory, and yet you have come to be with us in Christ Jesus, your only begotten, whom today we worship as sovereign king, ruler of the kingdom of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you are present with us now in the risen Christ, and we dedicate this worship to your glory and to your honor. We thank you that we have come together in this sanctuary, online, in mind, and in spirit, to bless the works of your hands, our mighty God, May all who seek you here today be filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. By your grace and according to your will, may the gospel of Jesus Christ be proclaimed, your truth be done, the destiny of creation fulfilled in Christ Jesus, so that the body of Christ, we your servants, be nurtured here and strengthened for the service of Christ in the world. In his name we pray, we ask these things, amen and amen. Please stand together and join together in our opening hymn of praise, crown him with many crowns.
please join together in the prayer of humility, which you can find printed in the bulletin. Loving and holy God, in all things you equip the saints for the work of ministry in Christ Jesus. Yet, holy God, we often forget to ask you what you desire for the people whom we serve. We often think that we must determine all outcomes and hold all answers to the challenges we face without ever prayerfully waiting to let you lead us. Forgive our lack of faith in your authority in our lives. Forgive our arrogance and ignorance of your way, your truth, and your life for all of us in Christ Jesus. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we trust that you are working in these moments to forgive our sins and to transform us into the fruitful disciples that you can use and direct to your glory and to your honor. Hear us now in silence as we prayerfully confess our sins to you. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. Friends, the truth is that God is always moving among us through the power of the Holy Spirit of Christ Jesus, so that together we might live a new life in the crucified and living Christ, binding us together in faith as we receive every good spiritual gift from God needed to fulfill our calling. May we together in common ministry, faith and worship, go from this place today in the confidence of our loving Father God that we are forgiven, made new, equipped for the life of Christ in us, made free. And friends, this is the good news of the gospel that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. <laughs> Please be seated. The first reading is from Daniel 7, 9 through 10, 13 through 14. As I watched and an ancient one took his throne, his clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. The second reading is from Revelation 1, 4b through 8. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the king of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, 
priest serving his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will well. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and, his, and who is to come, the Almighty. For those of you who might wonder, is that Daniel Burek that just read? <laughs> that was Adele Marcatoli, and we thank her for standing in for Daniel. He couldn't be here this morning. This is Christ the King Sunday, and this is the end of our liturgical year, our year B. And next Sunday begins a new year in the, in the life of the church, the first Sunday in Advent. And so today we celebrate the majesty and the kingship of Jesus Christ, who really is the king of the universe. And so this morning, our gospel reading comes to us from the writer of John's gospel, the 18th chapter, verses 33 through 37. As we prepare to hear this word that the Lord has to speak to each of our hearts and our minds this day, I would invite you to settle yourselves even more deeply within this reality of Christ Jesus that is here with us, that has promised to be with us when two or more are gathered together in his name. And we thank you, loving God, for your word that still speaks so uniquely to each life today. Individually and collectively, it has the power to transform us, to comfort us, to guide us, to reveal your truth, your living truth, that truly has the power to transform our lives so that we are able to anchor ourselves in you in the hope, in the hope that you hold all of your life within your hands, that you truly are the beginning and the end of all things, and that you draw all things to yourself and make all life new. We thank you for the revelation of your kingdom, for the grace that's imparted to us this day, the hearing of your word, for the faith to believe it, and the courage to be obedient to it. In Christ's name, in your name, loving God, creator, king, we ask these things. Amen and amen. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king and for this, I was born, and for this 
I came into the world to testify the truth, and everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Christ the King Sunday, and um, in, a, in a more formal way, the, the entire title is Christ the King of the Universe Sunday, not just of this world, but of the universe. And that matters that we, we get this, this image in our mind, if you will, that we take in this majesty. Because in reality, the universe is ever expanding. Probably most of us, when we have been, um, when we go back and think about our science classes, we were told there were millions of stars, maybe thousands, hundreds of stars, right? Now scientists tell us that the universe is expanding in such a way that for every one person, there are six galaxies. How about that? And there are 7.75 billion people on the world, according to Google today. <laughs> now, we probably can't even tell, really, how many galaxies there are. But that hyperbole is supposed to give us some sense of what's happening. God is never not creating in some way. There's a truth in that that we need to wrap our head around. It also tells us, in essence, we're pretty much dew on the grass, a speck of dust, a little blip in the time of everything. And yet at the same time, to me, this is what's so wondrous about God and God's love. At the same time, the scripture tells us in the Psalms 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You named me before I was born. Jesus told the disciples, as that truth tells us, God knows every hair on your head. You're cared about, you're loved. God so loved the world that God sent Jesus Christ into the world to reveal the truth of God. And so in essence, what today does is it helps us in our human mental capacity not to shrink God down to fit our thoughts about God, but rather God is expanding us to think wider and bigger in the majesty of God. That yes, we are a small part, a very small part of things, and yet we matter. And I don't know about you, but that brings me up short a little bit, that we matter. And so on this Sunday, we hear this scripture from John's gospel that we usually hear on Good Friday. And it's this conversation between Pilate and Jesus Christ. And Pilate is asking him if he's king of the Jews. Now this matters for this reason. Historically, John's gospel was written for a Roman Greco world that thought about faith a little differently than the Jewish believers. And so this was written probably, this gospel was written probably about 100 years after the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ Jesus, those truths that we proclaim. And so the church is no longer primarily Jewish converts, but rather Roman Greco people. And they thought about faith very differently. But they also would have known a little bit about the history of what's happening. In other words, what I mean is the Roman government which was really um, an imperial government that swallowed up different types of people, wanted very much to be and place within the Jewish nation their own king. And that was Herod who wanted to be the king. And in fact, he was helping to rebuild the temple in the time that Jesus lived so that they would make him king. That's what he wanted. And so Jesus was a true threat politically, but he was a threat religiously as well. There were many leaders within the temple system and in the religious system that were threatened by Christ Jesus because he was proclaiming a truth that was freeing people, 
and the religious leaders that really didn't understand what God was doing at the time and in the world and for the people didn't want them to be free. They wanted them to be a controlled, if you will, and in essence, they were being oppressed by that control. And Jesus, by his teaching, was freeing them. And so there were two very powerful entities coming against Christ Jesus at this time. And we hear this conversation between Pilate and Jesus, and Jesus was standing before Pilate because Herod had sent him to Pilate. So if you will, place in your mind how stressful a moment this would be. Now, for those of us who, who know this story, this is really the last few hours of the life of Jesus, but he's standing before a powerful leader and he's holding his own. And he's not reactionary. And I don't know about you, but I really, really like this about Christ Jesus. Some people would say, well, it's because he's God and he has all this power, but he was also human. He got mad, he got tired, he got hungry, he got thirsty. But in this moment that must have been incredibly stressful, where at this point he would have known that he was being betrayed by one of his followers, he was being uh, left alone by the people who he would have called his friends and his disciples. There was nobody left to be his advocate and to stand for him in a human context, even after all that he did and gave and loved and healed and fed and revealed to the people he was promised to come to. There was nobody in these moments who would stand for him and his truth. He was there by himself and he doesn't react in the way that maybe many of us would have reacted. I don't know about you, but I would have been fiercely angry and hurt and probably, you know, lost control of my senses and, and logic and language. And yet to the very end, he engages with this leader at this leader's level. And I hope we don't miss that either. Pilate probably was an intelligent man of the Roman Greco world and Jesus engages with him in a rational discussion. You know, who told you to say this? In other words, what he's saying to Pilate in that line is he's, he's saving him face. Do you not understand you're being used by people who don't want me? This doesn't even come from you, so why are we engaging in this conversation? He's giving him an out. And Jesus and Pilate go on to talk a little bit more about what this means. Jesus, in essence, is saying to Pilate in these words and in this conversation, I know who I am. I am so sure about my personhood and the purpose of God in these moments that I have no reason to justify one way or another what I have done or said in the past or what would happen next. Imagine that calm and that reason to have that ability to not allow the situation or this powerful leader to cause Jesus to react, but to act, to act in truth. The truth is, you have no idea. You have no idea. But I'm gonna share a little piece of that truth with you so that you might begin to be changed and transformed by that truth as people later will be, and really as, as I am. So we might wonder, well, it's a little idealistic, you know, who can really live that way? And yet, that's where we point to the great saints and people in everyday life who do this. And it gives us a witness, right? 
to this truth and how we can live it out too. Some of you might know who Sidney Harris was. He was a, a columnist and he had a great friend who was a Quaker and the Quakers are known for their, their peacefulness. And Harris was going to the corner market one day with his Quaker friend to get the newspaper. His Quaker friend went every evening to get the newspaper. And he went to the corner market and the person behind the counter, the gentleman behind the counter was this surly fellow. And his Harris's Quaker friend was very kind to him, thanked him, asked him how his evening was. There was simply no response. And there was a time in our, our civilization where we took that pretty seriously, right? I think we still do. When I was down south, that was a thing, right? You were always polite, no matter what, polite, kind, right? But in this case, when Harris asked his friend, why do you even bother? Why be so polite and kind to this this surly gentleman, he didn't even answer you. He just took your money and acted like you weren't there, ignored you. And his Quaker friend said this, why should I let him determine how I'll react? And Harris wrote in his column about this and wrote, most of us react, but it really is how Christ taught us to act. How do we act? It's easy to do when there's very little stress and we're happy and the Steelers are winning and <laughs> there's no traffic and we're through the pandemic, right? That's easy. And yet one of the things that the scripture does for us is it, it, it gives us these extreme circumstances if we look deeply, to reveal to us what the power of God can do for us as human beings that face all kinds of situations every day. Different extremes, but every day. And I don't know about you, but we are in a world right now that needs this truth where most countries, especially in Europe and Eastern Europe, where people are protesting and destroying property, and in our own country, in the Northwest and in the Midwest, and some of us may find that insulting, but it is a deep cry of human pain. People reach a level of frustration where they feel that's the only out for them. How do we pray? How do we care? How do we act? This past week, I had a family member call me. I'm going to call this person Joe. Joe called me and said, I, I have to share with you what happened at the hospital. This person, our family member Joe, works in a ward where they get uh, folks who are recovering from COVID and other serious illnesses and procedures where they're not recovering as quickly. So this is long-term, long-term care. So Joe had a patient that um, was close to dying. Family was getting ready for this. They were watching the, the signs and preparing for the imminent death of their, of their beloved son and husband. And so our family member, Joe, who is just a, a new nurse, really, went into the room, and every time Joe went into the room, began to talk to this patient, who was unresponsive, so eyes were not open, um, they were intubated, so they didn't speak, um, they, they weren't able to move physically. And so Joe would care for this patient and speak to them the whole time and pray for them the whole time. They were caring for this patient. Hello, I'm Joe. I'm praying for you now. I pray for you on the way into work. I pray for you tonight when I get home. People have been in here and they love you and they care about you. Never doubt the love of God. Just very comforting things like that. 
And then one day Joe went in and there was a St. Christopher medal and prayer put up above the bed. Now I know as Presbyterians, we don't necessarily pray to the saints. <laughs> and Joe happens to be Baptist, by the way. But when, um, when Joe went in to take care of the patient, said, oh, St. Christopher is over your bed. Your mother brought this medal and brought the card. And I love, I love this saint. And I pray to this saint. And this saint is watching over you. And just again, very comforting things. So when Joe called me on Thursday, Thursday morning, said I went in to the, I went into my shift and there was the patient sitting up and eating. And they're getting ready to release them home. And when I went in, I said, I so glad to see you. I'm, I'm Joe. And you know what the patient said? I saw you praying for me. I heard you praying for me. I don't know where I was. I was in a different world. But I saw you and I heard you and there was someone else saying to me, this person is watching over you and caring for you. They're praying for you. It's going to be okay. And Joe said, when I heard that, I just started to cry. <laughs> because in the midst of that care, there was another nurse that had come in when they needed to turn the patient in. And Joe was praying and talking to the patient. And the, the older nurse said, you know, he can't hear you. <laughs> and there was this validation in that moment where the patient said, I could... And Joe said, well, you were unresponsive. You, your eyes weren't open. I, you know, I'm not sure you saw me. In my mind's eye, I, saw, I knew you. As soon as you came in the room, I knew it was you who was caring for me and praying for me. And we got that message the day that a, a beloved family member was taken to Jameson and in intensive care, they're still there. They were intubated, and the doctors were saying 10% chance, maybe, you know, get ready. And my poor husband was just brokenhearted, and I said, you know, we have this story. We don't know what the outcome will be. It's not up to us to know the outcome. It is up to us to pray for the strength and the courage for our hearts to be softened, to trust in the truth that God is present. It may turn, not turn out the way we would hope for and want, but don't doubt that God can't speak to this family member while they're unconscious, while they're intubated. Don't doubt that God's truth can't speak to someone when we don't see that visible work. That's the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, you can't see this, but in my world, this is how it works. And I'm essentially saying to you, this world lives even now, this truth in me. And I'm gonna send a spiritual advocate to remind you of it. We don't hear those words. We know that truth. We proclaim that truth so that you can believe in these stressful moments. Now, some of us might say, well, I prayed in these ways. It didn't turn out. And I hear that. I pray in those ways too, and it hasn't turned out. But I was reminded this week when I asked for prayer for a family member by a, a member here at church, the lines that were in the quiet meditation a few weeks ago from Mother Teresa. I used to pray for this thing and that thing, this outcome and that outcome. Now I pray for strength to know what to do and how to do it. And that's what we hear in today's gospel. Jesus knew who he was, who he is. He prayed constantly for the strength and the courage to know how to act 
to know what to do, to know what to say, the life, the truth, the way. So that we, as a speck of dust in the universe, right, wonderfully and fearfully made in the image of God, might know this same truth, and this truth might give us life. So my brothers and sisters, I hope for you on this Christ the King Sunday that you recognize this majesty that resides within you, that loves you beyond all measure, that has a purpose for your life, that calls you to act with courage and strength in that purpose and to trust God, that God is acting and God is working both now as God has in the past and will continue to do into the future. For he has proclaimed, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Behold, I have all life within me and I make all things new and draw all peoples to myself. Alleluia and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we ponder the way the Lord is speak, speaking to each of our hearts and our minds this day, please stand and join together in our hymn of grace. You, Lord, are both lamb and shepherd. Please be seated, friends. You can go ahead if you'd like. You have a little cup. You probably have a little cup and a little bag, right? Feel free to take the lid off the cup and your bread out of the bag and place it there where you're comfortable. And you don't have to put the lid back on the cup after we finish. You can leave everything right there on the pew. And we thank Stephen and Gary who do such a beautiful job in cleaning the sanctuary after worship. So my brothers and sisters, we come into this time of sacrament, humble and in awe, really, 
of what God does for us and continues to do, not only for us, but for those who will follow after us. We're grateful, we're thankful for the legacy that we have been given and continue on to speak the truth of Christ Jesus in our own life and in the lives of others. And so I invite you into this time of holy sacrament, really, this wondrous meal that reminds us that we are part of something bigger and yet so valued in the part that we have been given. And so I invite you now to join together in our great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy, loving God, to give you all thanks and all praise. We thank you for this simple meal that was given to us that feeds us in so many ways. We believe that the mystical presence of Christ Jesus is here at this table calling us into a deeper relationship with you, loving God, with ourselves and with one another, reminding us of our connectedness in you as one body. We ask that you will speak in a new way to each mind, each heart this day, that our spirits will be renewed and our faith strengthened in your truth and in your power. And may we be filled with the reality of your Holy Spirit that sanctifies us, that is our advocate, that speaks for us in ways that we can't even imagine we need to speak. We thank you for the comfort and the peace that awaits us in these moments. And we ask your blessing upon it all. In Christ's name, amen. Luke's gospel tells us that when Jesus was at the table with his disciples whom he loved, that he gave thanks to the God of all creation. And looking at his disciples, he said, this is my body which shall be broken for you. After the meal, Jesus also took the cup he took the wine again. He gave thanks to the God of all creation who causes a grape to spring from the earth. Pouring out that wine, he said, this is my blood that is shed for you and for the forgiveness of all sin. And this is the new covenant that when you take this cup and you take this bread, you do this in memory of me. My brothers and sisters, I invite you now to take the cup and to take the bread of new life and the cup of salvation.
Join with me in prayer. Loving and holy God, we thank you. We praise you for this meal, these moments of worship. We praise you that you are king of the universe. This ever-expanding universe, the perfection of it, the beauty of it. We thank you that you have created us, that you have placed us in this time and in this place where such we were born for your purpose, to your glory and to your honor. And yet, you also hear us in our prayers. You hear our longing. You hear our joy. You hear our pain, our suffering. And we thank you that before a word is even across our tongue, you are already working. We dedicate to you this morning, loving God, the gifts that have come through this congregation, the monetary gift, and really the greatest gift, which is the time and the talent and the gift that so many offer in your name for your purpose to support the ministries and programs that you have entrusted to us here. And we dedicate to you as well our pledges to offer time and energy and income for what you have in store for 2022 to meet the need of people. May we continue to be in prayer as a congregation asking what this purpose is guided by your spirit and your wisdom and intelligence that still guides the universe today. And as we celebrate being part of such an extraordinary life, we also offer to you those things that we keep within the silence of our hearts and our minds. Loving God, as we continue to pray, to praise, we also, as we lift before you all of these things that we have said and thought and sung, listened to and pondered, that you take it all into yourself and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we trust the fact that life is truly transformed so that we might rest assured that in the end, that all shall be made well, all shall be made well, all manner of life within Christ Jesus shall surely be made well. And we believe that you hear us now in the prayer that Christ Jesus has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, please stand and join together in our closing hymn, Jesus Shall Reign Where Over the Sun.
My brothers and sisters, remember you have the life of God, the kingdom of God within you. You were called to take this out into the world and to never be afraid. For it is Jesus Christ who strides out before you. He goes ahead of you. He prepares a place for you. He waits there for you. And when you lose your way, I guarantee you, he will turn back on that road to meet you. And I bless you now in the power of our living God, our Abba Father, who loves you more than you could ever imagine. And Jesus Christ, who is the living manifestation of this life, this truth, and this way and the power of the Holy Spirit that has the power to bind you to God and to one another. Alleluia and amen.